Hello friends, I hope that you're doing well. It's been a hot minute since I've uploaded a video. Um, I've been either sick the last weekend or busy with other things going on in my life the couple weeks before that. Um, so it's been several weeks since I've uploaded and I've managed to finish quite a lot of books in sort of the month of February. So I am guess I'm sort of turning this into a, a February reading wrap up. So I have this huge pile, well, huge for me, ooh, pile of books that I finished. And this is a lot of books. And by the time I kind of got around to deciding to film reviews, I didn't want to a full-on review of each and every one of them. I didn't feel super incredibly strongly or passionate about any of them in particular or I just I didn't feel like making full-blown video reviews for all of them so I'm sort of just doing an overall February reading wrap-up where I'll do a kind of smaller review for each of them so this video might be a little longer than my normal reviews but it'll be chock full of all of these books um, shorter reviews for all of these so without further ado let's get right into it so starting with my least recently finished book we have Small Great Things, an adult contemporary novel by Jodi Picoult. So this follows Ruth Jefferson, an experienced labor and delivery nurse at a Connecticut hospital. One day she's assigned to care for uh, the newborn child of a young white supremacist couple who immediately inform the hospital that they don't want Ruth, who is black, to touch their son. The head nurse honors their request and soon after that the baby goes into cardiac distress and Ruth is the only nurse available on the scene. So she's torn between obeying orders and doing everything she can as a nurse to try and save his life. And as a result of this conflict, Ruth is charged with a serious crime. So in addition to Ruth's perspective, we also follow Kennedy, a white public defender who takes her case, as well as Turk, the white supremacist father. So Turk's chapters, his POVs, were pretty hateful and disgusting, but also really fascinating because you get to see the numerous experiences and influences that culminate into a hateful individual like Turk. And poor Ruth and her high school age son go through a lot, and this book tackles some difficult and relevant subjects like racism, privilege, and justice, or lack thereof, you might say. Um, Small Great Things was thought-provoking and frustrating. Um, like the character Kennedy, um, I find it a little intimidating and scary to talk about issues of race, if I'm just being completely honest, uh, because I don't want to come across as someone who is ignorant or insensitive, um, and I have so little personal experience to draw from. Um, but one thing that this book did do was demonstrate how a lack of conversation can be just as damaging. Um, and it, it helped reiterate to me that racism doesn't always look like the neo-Nazi white nationalist spitting racial slurs. Um, it can be found in the little things that those lucky enough to be born in the right skin take for granted. Some people might be skeptical of this book because um, Jodi Picoult is a middle-aged white lady. Um, she has her portrait here on the back. Um, she's not black. Um, in her author's note, she explains that she spent years writing this book and did a lot of research and interviews with people who are black to get a more accurate perspective. Um, it's hard for me to judge the authenticity here, so I'm just gonna kind of leave that at that. Um, I gave it four out of five stars. The first 150 pages really gripped me and I flew through them, um, but I felt like it started to kind of drag on for the next set of 150 pages before finally picking back up through to the end. Um, the subject matter is relevant and important, uh, and the story was emotional and well written, and I think that this was aimed towards an audience that already agrees that racism equals bad. Um, it's just a way to sort of kick off conversation in book clubs. <laughs> I, th I think it's it's a great book club book. Um, and it was, this was a, uh, a book club read uh, for the group that I'm a part of uh, locally. Um, and you know, I'd like to think that I finished the book a little more aware and wiser than I was before. 
The next book that I read was Dragon Sword and Wind Child by Noriko Ogiwara and translated from Japanese into English by Kathy Hirano. This is the first in a series called Tales of the Magatama. It takes place in a land called Toyo Ashihara, which as I understand is essentially another name for Japan. Um, a 15 year old girl named Saya has lived her life in the village of Hashiba, where they and many others across this land worship the god of light and his two immortal children, Prince Tsukishiro and Princess Teruhi, who live among them on earth. One fateful day, Saya learns that she is actually the reincarnation of Princess Sayura, the water maiden, and is essentially destined to serve the goddess of darkness. And this goes against everything that she grew up to believe, uh, loving the light. And her adventure has her struggling to decide, you know, which to choose, what to do in order to save Toyo Ashihara, the light or the darkness. Now, this sounds great. It, it just sounded like it would absolutely appeal to me. It sounds like it'd be a fun, you know, anime fantasy adventure, you know, a powerful princess uh, torn between two sides, which will she choose? But honestly, this was so boring so boring. There are some vaguely interesting things that happen at the very very end, but for the most part it just felt like a whole lot of nothing happened. Um, or rather, I wasn't emotionally invested at all with what was going on. Saya herself was useless. She was nothing but a plot device, even though she was apparently super important as the water maiden, but you never get to see her doing anything cool or useful. She was just swept along by other people or events and was just miserable all the time, and I was just so over her constant pity party and her weird relationships and fascinations with the gods of light. One thing I did like was the idea that in this story, there wasn't exactly good or evil in either the light or darkness. Um, the light was all about being utterly devoted to something to a fault and, you know, tossing out things like compassion in order to achieve the ideal. Um, and the darkness was about mischief and enjoying life because of its impermanence. Um, both are, you know, admirable in their own way, kind of like yin and yang but it isn't like a new or revolutionary concept to play with the idea that light is actually kind of bad and the darkness is actually not as bad as you might think. Um, and again, this was translated from Japanese, so I'm wondering if maybe some cultural differences between Japanese storytelling and European or American storytelling kind of influenced my feelings on this. I would have enjoyed this a lot more, I think, if it was half its length. It's 300 pages and so much of it felt pointless. Um, as it is, I had to force myself to push through and finish this book. I gave it two out of five. Um, I won't be reading the rest of the series, um, which I think is an anthology, but still. Um, you know, and unless you're looking for any and all translated Japanese fantasy and folklore stories, folklore stories, um, I wouldn't recommend this. The next book I read was Everything Everything by Nicola Yoon. This is a YA contemporary romance that follows 18 year old Madeline Whittier who suffers from a disease that makes her allergic to the world. Um, any little thing might set off a potentially fatal allergic reaction, so she's lived almost her entire life inside her sterilized house with her mom, who is also her doctor, and her full-time nurse, Carla, and she's never left it, never left her house. Um, and for many years she was content with that, until one day new neighbors move in next door, including a boy named Ollie. Through electronic means like instant messaging, she and Ollie get to know each other and develop feelings for one another. But the question of the book is, you know, can she find a way to be with someone who isn't compatible uh, with the way she has to live her life? I loved this. <laughs> I loved it and I didn't expect to at all. Um, I totally expected this to be just a meh read. Um, for one thing, I didn't realize that this is actually um, presented in a mixed media format. So it's a mix of first person narration from the main character Madeline, um, instant messages, emails, illustrations, 
various documents and just all this stuff rolling together to create this dynamic story that kept me entertained and engrossed from start to finish. Um, at the time, um, I would have, I could have finished this in a day um, if I had the time. Um, it was just so good and actually ends in a way that you might not expect. I will admit that apart from Maddie, the main character, the characters aren't too deeply developed. Um, but they were still good and entertaining characters and uh, Maddie's interactions with them and thoughts about them were powerful and, and you know, made them better and more interesting. Um, she's biracial, half Japanese, half African American, so there's um, that representation which is cool. Um, Nicola Yoon's daughter is biracial, so she wanted to write a book with a main character that reflected that as well. Um, there are two major themes that I noticed most strongly and both are equally relevant in the story. Um, the big one is that there's a difference between being alive and actually living. And the other is that love changes people and can make them do some pretty crazy things. Um, I think both of these moments are, or these points are accurate and are shown very clearly and in an interesting way. There is some teenage recklessness on Maddie's part. Although the fact that she has never left her house for basically her entire life has understandably built up a lot of tension that was bound to be released somehow, and the arrival of Ollie was just the straw that broke the camel's back, um, I think some might be tempted to cry insta-love here, um, and I mean this is why a contemporary romance, but I think that the relationship between Maddie and Ollie was very sweet and respectful and loving, and I really enjoyed it. I gave this five out of five stars. Um, I loved it from beginning to end. Would recommend if you're looking for an easy to read contemporary YA romance. Book number four that I read was The Infamous Fangirl by Rainbow Rowell. I had heard this book mentioned so many times on booktube, lots of kind of mixed reviews and feelings, so I was very curious as to where I would fall. Um, so our main character is Cather Avery, who goes by Kath. She and her twin sister Ren are starting their freshman year at, I think, Lincoln University in Nebraska. And both Kath and Ren grew up obsessed with this fantasy book series called Simon Snow, which is an extremely successful franchise, um, surpassing even Harry Potter um, in this world. So I'd call this sort of an alternate reality contemporary novel. Um, Kath is still very much enamored with the world of Simon Snow and is one of the most well-known authors of Simon Snow fan fiction. In particular, um, her extremely popular ongoing story called Carry On Simon Snow. But at this point when the story begins, uh, college has begun and Ren seems, sort of seems intent on distancing herself from Kath and Simon. Uh, Kath has to wrestle with leaving her single dad alone at home while they're away at school. She has to deal with an unfriendly roommate and her ever-present boyfriend and other just college-related things. Um, the book is all about Kath's struggle to navigate through this intimidating new chapter in her life and how Simon Snow and fan fiction fits into it all. So I was hoping that I would like this more than I did. I ended up giving it a three out of five stars. Um, I think it was very realistic in a lot of ways. There were a lot of very subtle scenes and moments that showcase Kath's antisocial and anxious behaviors, her fears and her worries and her struggles. She's a troubled character and this was a, it was a lot heavier hitting than I thought it would be. However, <laughs> I didn't like most of the characters in this book, um, and I think that's one of the main reasons I didn't particularly care for it. They're all assholes, if I'm being honest. Um, Kath is an asshole, her roommate Reagan is an asshole, the love interest Levi is an asshole in his own way. I'm just not the kind of person who's drawn to people like that. Um, I'll never want to be friends with people who treat others the way that Kath and Reagan treat others. And then Levi is he's super duper friendly to a fault and I think he's a bit cocky and assumes that the entire world loves him. Um, like for instance this one scene actually really pissed me off. Um, he's carrying Kath's dirty laundry basket down the hall um, they're walking together and he he smugly refuses to let her carry it like despite her insisting and asking him over and over to give her her clothes back 
Just give her the damn laundry basket, dude. You're being a jerk and it isn't cute. Anyway, yeah, just that's my personal opinion. <laughs> Despite that though, there's a lot that I can relate to in this. Um, I was also a bit of a shut-in for most of college and I loved losing myself in the world of fandoms, um, in particular Supernatural. SPN family for the win. Um, I have read, written, and to this day still write fan fiction for myself. Um, I don't publish it online or anything, um, but I do it for me and my enjoyment, and I understand 100% the comfort and joy that fandoms bring to people in those communities. Um, and I think I expected this to be even more focused on the fandom aspects than it was, but this book felt very raw and reflected a lot of truths that I believe about the world. Um, you know, things happen and sometimes you don't really know why or you can't explain why. Life can be this culmination of experiences with turning points that you can't pinpoint exactly or remember clearly how you got there. Um, or there are things going on that you don't know about that contribute to something happening. People, you know, sometimes people just seem to change and you don't understand why, but it hurts and you can't figure out a way to fix it or you don't have the courage or the energy to do so. Um, and all of that was shown in this book, and I think that's what really connected me to it, um, apart from the fandom aspect of it. Um, everybody has issues. We're all messed up. <laughs> so I liked this book fine. <laughs> I didn't like the characters very much, um, but the twin sister dynamic between Kath and Ren was compelling. Um, I liked all the bits about fan fiction. So yeah, I mean, read it if the premise sounds interesting to you. The next book I read was I Am Spock, an autobiography by the late and great Leonard Nimoy. Uh, this was originally published in 1995, but this edition in particular was uh, published posthumously in 2015. Leonard was best known, of course, for playing Spock in Star Trek the original series and other Star Trek movies and TV series. I am a proud Trekkie and was very sad when he passed away. Um, I was in college, um, so this was an eventual must read for me. Um, and it was great, you know, five stars. Um, he wrote about his journey as both an actor and director, his experiences performing on stage, the evolution of Spock as a character, and how the Vulcan will always be a part of him. Um, this book was sort of a follow-up to his first autobiography that was titled I Am Not Spock, which I admit I haven't read, but I think people sort of bristled at that title and thought that he resented the character, which wasn't the case. I actually wrote several papers on Star Trek in college. Uh, I'm a nerd, so I knew a lot of the things about the history of the show's development and cancellation and uh, resurgence of popularity when it went into syndication, um, but it was cool to learn more about Leonard specifically and his experiences just in the entertainment industry overall following the success of Star Trek and his character. If you're only interested in Star Trek or Spock the character exclusively and don't care much about Leonard Nimoy and his other work, then this might not be for you. But um, if you want to learn more about Leonard and his life, both Trek and non-Trek, then this is wonderful. Um, he seemed like such a passionate and uh, dedicated person in all that he did. And I'm grateful to him for so masterfully portraying Spock in such a culturally significant show. Live long and prosper, Trekkies and non-Trekkies alike. And finally, I read the second book in the Path to Ascendancy trilogy by Ian Esselmont, Dead House Landing. So you're following along on the continuing adventures of Dancer, a skilled assassin, and Wu, an eccentric but deceptively skilled mage who takes on the name Kellenved in this book which he literally just made up and thought it sounded cool. The last book saw them fleeing the continent of Quantali and headed for the island of Malaz, which is occupied by pirates and privateers and criminals. Um, Kellenved has the lofty goal of essentially taking over the island, and of course in the process other things happen to make those plans difficult. Um, in particular, they become focused on uncovering the mystery of the aforementioned Dead House, 
um, an ominous and dangerous bit of property on the island that is far more than it seems. There are quite a few POV changes in this book and you meet lots of new characters, but I think I enjoyed this more than the first book because I was more familiar with the world and magic system and some of the original characters. Plus, this book didn't have siege like the first one did. I'm not a fan of the inherently slow pacing of sieges in any book. I was very in the mood for fantasy pirates when I read this, um, so I picked it up after um, immediately after finishing The Priory of the Orange Tree, which I will be making a separate video for um, because it was amazing and I have a lot to say about it, and that book also had pirates, so that helped influence my positive uh, reception to Dead House Landing, I think. So I don't want to say too much more without spoiling because it is uh, the second book, um, but I enjoyed it, uh, gave it four out of five stars, and I am looking forward to reading the last book in the trilogy. Thank you guys so much for sticking around and watching this kind of long video. Um, I read a lot of books um, and it was great. Um, I had some winners, some that were okay, some that I didn't really like at all, um, but it was a very productive reading month. I read a lot um, and I will be recording very soon um, my review of The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon, which I buddy read with um, Erica from Aura Books on YouTube. She's amazing. She's wonderful. It was so much fun. Uh, we had a really good time reading this um, and I have a lot to say about it. So I'll be recording a separate video uh, reviewing that. But um, anyway, thank you guys so much for sticking around and I hope you guys enjoyed this video and let me know if you've read any of the books that I reviewed or if you might be picking some of them up if they sounded interesting to you. Um, anyway, I will see you guys next time and I hope you guys have a great day. Bye!